Monterey. What was Monterey? Monterey was simply an apartment building in Melbourne, but it was taken over by the Navy in 1942 to house a secret intelligence unit called FRAMEL. Now FRAMEL stands for Fleet Radio Unit Melbourne. It was a top secret facility that was decoding Japanese naval traffic during World War II, and it would coordinate with a similar sort of unit out of England, and one in Hawaii and one in Washington. Now, it was a really a joint effort between the Australian and American navies, but it was mostly staffed by RANs. Now, RANs were women from the Royal Australian Navy Service. Now, these women were responsible for decoding messages and their, their contribution to the war effort is enormous. For example, six months after the war breaks out, they decode a message that the Japanese Navy is in the Solomon Islands and they're heading towards Port Moresby. Now, the Japanese intended on invading and taking over Port Moresby because they believed if they did, they would be able to disrupt all naval traffic between America and Australia, and really, it would mean excising Australia out of the war. Now, they would pass that message on to the Allied Navy, who would be able to get itself into position, and on the 4th of May, 1942, would begin the Battle of the Coral Sea, a four-day battle that would deliver Japan its first defeat during World War II. Now, the Japanese weren't going to give up on Port Moresby. They intended on delaying that attack for three months, but as we know, it'll never happen. Why? Because a month later, the same group of women would decode a message that the Japanese Navy is going to take over Midway Island. Now, if they'd done that, they'd have been able to control all sea traffic in the South Pacific. The Japanese fleet was enormous. It was far superior to the Allied Navy. But because they had this intelligence and they knew what was going on, they were able to ambush them and change the direction of the war because the Allied Navy would sink four of Japan's biggest aircraft carriers. So that was a massive defeat to Japan. These women would code hundreds of messages during World War II that would save thousands of lives by allowing convoys to avoid contact with the enemy or being ambushed themselves. One of the things they did was decode a message that Yamamoto, the Admiral of the Japanese Imperial Navy, in April of 1943 was doing a bit of a tour of the South Pacific Islands. And they decoded that message of what he was doing, but more importantly, they worked out his itinerary and where he was going to be and how he was going to get there. That information was assisted with by the American Navy. Information passed on to the American Air Force. They sent a squadron out there, a long-range squadron, and they shoot down Yamamoto's plane. And that is a massive hit to the Japanese morale. All come from the women that worked here at Monterey. Now, most of these women will never be able to share that, that secret and their contribution to the war effort with their families because they signed a secrecy act for 50 years. But one such lady still exists and she's 98 year old Jessie Flanders, the last decoder from Monterey. Mrs. Flanders, <laughs> thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. It's a pleasure. We would like to talk about your amazing experience during World War II and we have learnt it's ultra secret. <laughs> so we believe that you have been held to uh, under the Secrecy Act for most of your life. Well, for 40 years, yes. yes. So could you tell us, you were at Monterey, correct? Yes, yes. So could you tell us how you finished up there and what happened? Well, uh, I was at boarding school when the war broke out and I went home at Christmas time because I was leaving school and I told my parents that I wanted to go back to Melbourne and get a job because that was going to be my war effort. And they said, but girls don't live by themselves in Melbourne. You can't do that. So I talked and talked. And then eventually my sister came. So she and I shared a flat. And I got a job with the Shell Company. And then all the station hands were leaving home and father wanted my sister to go home and be a land girl. So then I had to find new accommodation, uh, which wasn't very good. And my school friend said to me, she had a, a job that she couldn't leave because it was a protected job. 
And she asked me if I'd join the Navy with her, and I said, oh, that's a good idea, because I was sick of the uh, Shell Company. It was, uh, it was winter time, and it was cold and wet in the mornings, and then with the alteration of the times, because the trams used to get so crowded. So some offices started at 8 o'clock, the Shell Company started at 8.30, and other places went to 9 o'clock. So, um, you know, you'd leave home at quarter to eight and it would be dark and cold and wet and miserable. <laughs> and then you get out at half past four and then the darkness, everything, the winter. So when she suggested we should join the Navy, that was a great idea. Now, you were saying in your book that they actually bricked up all the lower floor windows. That's right, yes, for, for, to try to make the building stronger if Melbourne was bombed. And that was like working in a cave because you'd go in and it would be dark and... And, you know, for a country girl, that was no good. <laughs> anyway, we, we joined up and we went to Point Lonsdale for two weeks training and we got our uniform and injections and learned to march. And then they told us we were going to Monterey. Yes, I think they did tell us we were going to Monterey, but we had no idea what that meant. We were a wee bit disappointed that we were being left in Melbourne, actually. <laughs> You're looking for some adventure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Navy didn't have anywhere for girls to live if they weren't living at home. So I went to live with my friend Mary and her family, and they were very, very good to me. And when we got to Monterey, it was a, a flat that the Navy had taken over. And there was a, an American guard on each door with a pistol on his hip. And we had to uh, produce our identity to be able to go in. And when, the first day we went in, we had to swear on the Bible that we wouldn't tell anybody what we were doing at Monterey. And if we did, we'd be court-martialed. And if the Japanese found out that we were doing decoding there, they, they'd come and bomb the place. So it was very important not to talk. So that was OK. And we were working watches. We used to work from 8 till four o'clock for two days and then from four till midnight and then the last three days would be from midnight to the morning and Mary couldn't adjust her sleeping time it, that didn't worry me but she she couldn't so she went on to day watch and then we moved because we as the war progressed there were more and more messages to be decoded more and more rants came in, and so we were very crowded at Monterey. So they built a, it looked like a wool shed, a big, long, tin shed with barbed wire all around it. And we moved there, and there was always a, a, two guards on the gate. And, yeah, so <laughs> then to, to tell you more about our actual work, the messages would come in from the Japanese. They were sending messages to their, mostly to their naval base because we were Navy. The Air Force was doing the same thing and the Army. Uh, but they would send a message to tell them what they wanted them to do, to rendezvous at a certain place and go and bomb a place or attack a, a convoy. Uh, but the message would come in, in uh, code, which was in numbers, and they broke the code very early each day, which was amazing. By 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, we, we'd have the new code broken. So because, how, how was that done? Well, the, they were stupid enough. <laughs> <laughs> to, the first message they sent each morning was the weather. And, of course, they could work it out, get a lot of words from, from that. And, and just, do you do the decodes in the paper? <laughs> <laughs> it's no. the same sort of thing. <laughs> and... Um, Yes. Uh, so they decoded the weather message, so that allowed them to decode the message for the, for the day. Yes, yes. I mean, it gave them all the letters they needed, and they'd have a bit of a guesswork and, and work it out. So these messages were gathered from signal stations gathered throughout, what, the northern part of Australia, or...? Uh, I think there were special places. I know uh, Adelaide River was one place, and Townsville was another, um, and I don't know where the other places were, but there were other people that got picked the messages up, and then they sent them on a teleprinter, right. which was a great big machine, yep. um, and it, it typed it all out, and we could tear that off and then decode it. So they were numbers you were getting? Yeah. Right. Yep. 
Um, and then, of course, when we decoded, it was in Japanese. But I quickly learned quite a lot of Japanese words, which I've now forgotten, um, like a, a destroy or a submarine or attack. Uh, and when I saw that in a message that I was decoding, I'd take it into the translators and say, what's this all about? So, you know, I knew a fair bit about what was happening, which was interesting. So I'm just going to go through that again. So mm. you would get a information in numbers, you mm. break those numbers back into words, which would be Japanese, Japanese yes. and then they would have to be translated, you would have a quick translation, find the words of significance, yes. and then take that to be... To the translator, who put it into English, right. and then on the hour, every hour, the car left Monterey and went up to the Victorian barracks, where they if could, if it was the, you know, a certain place they could warn them you're going to be attacked at 10 o'clock in the morning or you know the convoy they know the convoy is sailing up the east coast of Borneo if you are there at such and such an hour you can raid them yep uh, and so we, you know it was quite interesting you'd, you'd know all these things so it really was very important that it was kept as a top secret uh, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, so Monterey was actually um, responsible for a number of major game changes during World War II, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, they had a lot to do with the Coral Sea battle. Uh, they picked that up, that the, the, this convoy was coming around bringing uh, soldiers that they were going to land at Port Moresby, which would be a very close stomping off place for Australia. Uh, but we picked that up. And so the Americans and the Australians had their naval ships there ready when they came. And there was a huge battle and terrible loss of life. And uh, then the Japanese retired. And that was the first time that they'd been beaten in the war. And that was the beginning, I suppose, of the end. And the other very important one was when <coughs> the Japanese were uh, going to raid Midway Island. And if they had got that, they would have had control of the whole of the Pacific. Um, and we also picked that up. So uh, we had, well, the, actually it was the Americans, I think. They had a, a, a boat, uh, um, what do you call them, aircraft carrier, in the close proximity, so that when these aeroplanes came in, they went out and bombed them. And then, then they sunk all their... Um, aircraft carriers and so once again the Japanese had to retire and they really that was the beginning of the end then they we won Borneo back and fought from there and uh, so because I was reading an article um, in a website that said that uh, that incident of deciphering actually disappeared from history no one mm. has ever been able to validate how Midway was actually tipped off. Yes. It's a, it's a bit of controversy, even to this very day. Yes, yes. Well, I've got plenty of books. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you have. Yeah, and, and they, they say how, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was the beginning of the end of the war because then the Japanese had to keep going. And uh, I always stress this, the, when the Japanese were driven back and back and back and they eventually were lost everything and they were going to be fighting from Japan, well, there was no way they would ever give in. They would have fought till every man was gone. So it was very important to, to end the war quickly. Yes. Well, it's an awful thing. <laughs> it is. Mm. But um, the other thing at Monterey, it was responsible for the killing of Yamamoto too, wasn't yes, it? Yes, that's the... right. Yes, well, we, we picked that one up. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> and a big blow to the Japanese, yes. their morale. He, he, he was the head of the Navy, I think, wasn't yeah, he? He was, mm, and mm, so mm. it was a big blow to the Japanese. Okay, I would like to you just to tell us about yourself. I mean, you're, the, the viewer obviously doesn't realise you're 98. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably one of the last of the decoders... Yes, yes, because I kept in touch with quite a lot of the girls, but one yep. by one they all gone. Yep. Um, so no, there are not many of us left. And uh, the British government, yeah, I think it was in 2010, the, the Prime Minister sent us a little um, medallion uh, and 
uh, certificate uh, thanking us for the work that we had done during the war and that it had shortened the war by two years. So that was very nice, but you see, by that time, quite a lot of the uh, RANs had gone. Yeah. Yeah, so anyway... Um, but the Australian government still refuses to acknowledge that's right. the contribution, <laughs> doesn't it? That's right. And the Americans wanted to give Monterey a, um, an award, um, but the Prime Minister of the day said we couldn't accept uh, overseas decorations, but he accepted one for himself. <laughs> <laughs> that's because you're Prime Minister. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I used to get the tram down to Arak Road, St Kilda Road, then get another tram down to the stop where I'd meet the other girls and we'd walk around, because it was the other side of uh, Lake Albert, this new building, and we'd walk around that. So that was OK, but one night my tram must have been late because as I got off the Turak tram, I saw this car tram I wanted disappearing. So I waited about 15 minutes for a tram to come. And I got down to the tram stop, and of course the girls thought I wasn't coming, so they went without me. So I thought, well, that's okay. I can I can walk around. I'm not frightened of the dark. But as I was walking around, it was inky black. Because Melbourne was in a brownout, and I could hear footsteps behind me. So I thought, well, I, I won't panic. I'll just walk a little bit quicker. But then the footsteps got a bit quicker, and suddenly I did panic. <laughs> <laughs> and I ran as fast as I could and I fell through the gate and the uh, guard said to me, what's wrong with you? And I said, oh, there's somebody following me. So he jumped out on the road with his pistol drawn, but there was nobody there. But did they disappear into the dark or was it imagination? So we worked, uh, we had to walk, I had to walk past a, a big high wooden fence and we think it must have been my footsteps echoing on that. <laughs> and well, when the, the other girls were there and were all ch talking, we never noticed it. <laughs> true, but it was, I think it's a good idea to run anyway. Yeah, I think it was sure. too. And, and a better idea, I didn't tell Mrs Randall. <laughs> 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 oh, gee. <laughs> and so I was with the Randalls until the end of the war, and then Monterey just died like that. And so we were told we wouldn't be discharged uh, until the men had come home and been discharged. So we probably wouldn't be discharged for about six months. Can so I went over to Adelaide as Can a you driver. describe that? Because you do in your book. It's actually a lovely story. I'm sure the average person in Australia has no idea what you're talking about driving in a brownout. Well, probably not. No, I don't think anybody, if they weren't living in Melbourne, knew the preparation for being raided. Uh, because they'd dug uh, trenches uh, in all the gardens and the parks. Um, and as I say, the buildings were reinforced if they could uh, to try and make, make them stronger if, if there was a raid. Um, and they, they had the brown out, and about every third street light was le left on, but it had a hood around it, so it was really pretty dark. And every house had to have um, blackout curtains and they had a, a um, person who, who walked the streets and if they saw any light they'd be knocking on your door and saying you know you're showing a light um, yeah oh yes I often and, wonder and hooded cars the lights oh yes the cars? yes the, the cars yeah. were on dim and hooded and the traffic lights were hooded and they've remained hooded ever since. <laughs> <laughs> they have. They Some have. Lights have. Yes. <laughs> That's right. So that would have been pretty, pretty dark and pretty hard to drive. Anyway, it was. Yes, yeah. and yeah, people in in uniforms and dark clothes, you couldn't see them. So yeah. you had to be very careful. Mm. It was. We'll just go back because we were halfway and through that before we interrupted, and you were talking about <laughs> being a relief driver and driving around Melbourne. Oh, yes. The fact that there was, you know, there was no, everything was hooded out, there was no lights, people had their windows blacked out with curtains. Yes, yes, so you can imagine that when it was declared the war was over, <laughs> it was very exciting. The curtains were thrown back and people rushed to the city and were dancing and I was on duty and I just couldn't believe it because we knew for seven days that we were just waiting for the Japanese to accept the peace, but would they or wouldn't they? And so when it came through that they had, it, it was so exciting. And then next morning I was on duty again and I went down and everything was dead. You know, all the computers were turned off. Uh, and uh, we were told then that 
you know, we wouldn't be discharged for five or six months. But after you, after you left the navy, mm -hmm, I went home yeah. with the intention of having a couple of months at home and then going back to Melbourne and getting a job because I just like being active and I like having something to do, feeling that I was needed. Um, but then I met a very attractive young man. Oh no! <laughs> so, <laughs> that delayed my trip back to Melbourne. <laughs> so eventually we got engaged and got married. And he was Bob Patterson from Warwick, which is an historic home. And so I lived there for 30 years. Uh, we had it uh, classified by the National P Trust as A, A class classification. The other thing is that, because your husband didn't know about your, you knew when you were in the Navy and yes. during the war, but had no idea of the magnificent contribution no. you had made. And when, when I was in the Navy and people say to me, what do you do in the Navy? I said, oh, clerical work. <laughs> and I told my parents that, and so my father never knew. I think my mother knew because she lived to a long age. She was 95 and she delayed of following in her footsteps. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so. So, yeah, they. And your kids only found out? About 1990. Okay. Yes. 1990. Oh, okay, yep. Yes, it, it was about 40 or 50 years after the war. Right. Um, uh, but they had no idea. I mean, they, they just thought I was a driver. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's just, yes. Fascinating. Mm, mm. But it, it's uh, good that it is being recorded now because, as I say, not only for myself, but for all the girls that worked at Monterey. <laughs> yeah, no. that's right. <laughs> yes. I don't know how many flats were there. Um, but there would have probably been half a dozen of them. But it was all so secretive that I didn't know what the people in the room next door were doing. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things I did want to talk to you about. So how, how was it set up inside you? I think from the book you said that you, one of the telex machines was actually in the fireplace. Yes. There was two of you in a very small room. So That's right, yes, yes. Uh, I presume that's where the, the stove would have been. And right. it was a big machine. A teleprinter, I think they called it. Uh, and when we tore them off and and decoded them, well, then the torn off bit was put on a bulldog grip on a long rope, and we used to drop it down the, the place where, in a kitchen, you'd be putting your scraps. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. That's <laughs> right. It, it would drop down, and then the girls there would file it away. And sometimes they'd be a bit slow and wouldn't have taken it off, and you'd pull the... Um, bulldog grip up and here's the one you'd already sent down so we'd bump it up and down like this you know, come and take this <laughs> it must have been a fairly high pressure job because you you know to decode these messages was time critical that's right yes and and, and we had to do it as quickly as we could and that was one terrible night i got two messages at once one was a short one and one one was much longer so i thought well i'll do the short one they can be translating that while I'm decoding this other one. But the one, the long one was the important one. And the, the decoder, at least the translator came in and told us, you know, we've got three hours to, to get notice to the convoy that's going to be attacked. Um, and I sort of felt guilty and thought, oh, I should have done that one first, but how was I to know? <laughs> yeah. It was the luck of the draw, but yes. Yeah, so it would have been, yeah, emotionally it would have been very taxing Yes. And working shift work on top of that. That's right, yes, yes. But yes, well, actually we were attached to the American 7th Fleet. Yep. Um, but so, Commander, oh, I mentioned him in my book, I can't remember his name at the moment. Um, he was in charge of the Americans, and C Captain Jack Newman was in charge of the Australians. But. <laughs> If we passed an officer in the in the passage who was supposed to salute them, even if we didn't have our hat on, <laughs> and uh, most of them had just walked straight past, but the man that was in charge of the Americans, I can't think of his name, uh, he always used to give us a nod and say, good morning. So I felt at least he recognised us. <laughs> <laughs> well, like some of those other pompous... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a wonderful story and I'm, I thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
of for me. taking the time out to talk to us. Thank you very much. I, I hope we can piece it together. <laughs> we, we, we will definitely be able to piece something together. But on behalf of everybody who watches this, I'd like to thank you for your service. Thank you for your contribution to the life we have today and the peace and the prosperity that we do take for granted, but we should recognise that it came from hard work, dedication and a willingness for people like yourself to step up when it was needed. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you for that. That's very kind of you to say that. Thank you. And on the back it says, we serve too. <laughs> and I, I like that. I love it. That's beautiful. <laughs> but it's pretty, isn't it? It is. It's mm. absolutely stunning. Mm. And sometimes I wear it on uh, Armistice Day or Anzac Day. But then I'm so busy <laughs> decorating myself with all my war things because I've got two medals that I actually earn. <laughs> Have you got those here? Mm -hmm. oh, we'd love to see those too. Thank you. Um, one is the uh, uh, Pacific War and the other one is the 1939-1945 medal. Right. So I can wear those. <laughs> and then this was something very special actually. They produced this for the women uh, because we couldn't join the RSL in those days. Oh, of course not. <laughs> so you see there's the Navy the Army and the Air Force, or the wings of the Air Force. Yeah, that's, that's special for the women. Yeah.